folks, and please do not hesitate to make this uh, webinar interactive by asking some questions in the Q&R, uh, uh, in the Q&R uh, on the lowest part uh, of the screen. Um, as you can see, uh, uh, regarding the pool that we made, uh, there are people from all over the world uh, attending uh, this webinar from uh, Central Eastern Europe, Middle East, America, Australia, uh, Europe, and so uh, this is a, this is really a, a great pleasure to have this uh, worldwide attendance. So um, I think maybe uh, that we can start with the first presentation. Uh, can I have the hand to yes? Okay. So um, I will start uh, by uh, giving some uh, general information about uh, cobblation. Um, so just give it one click on the slide, please. Okay, you're good to go. Okay. So, so cobblation uh, uh, started in 1993. Um, uh, the term cobblation stands for controlled ablation, and uh, it is used not only in ENT but in various medical fields such as orthopedics. Uh, on the uh, on the right part of my slide, you can see a picture of the use of cobblation for uh, a, knee, uh, a knee joint uh, arthroscopy and uh, treatment. Um, in our specialty, as you know, uh, the main indications to use cobblation is tonsillectomy and uh, adenoidectomy. But uh, as you probably know, it's also used in other head and neck regions, such as for a tongue, uh, tongue base uh, tonsil removal and uh, various procedures uh, in the nasal cavities, paranasal sinuses, and also in the larynx. Um, an important point is that it is a chemical and not a thermal ablation process. So uh, what is the uh, principle of uh, the functioning of this uh, cobblation? It is based on the bipolar configuration and uh, uh, on the use of a radio frequency current, uh, which is used in a solution uh, with ions and especially uh, a, a, saline, uh, a saline solution, which is absolutely uh, uh, compulsory if you want uh, your cobblation to work. So there must be some saline between your instruments and uh, the target tissue. Uh, so uh, this cobblation uh, tool uh, creates a high density energy field, which uh, in turn creates uh, what is called a stable plasma layer. And this plasma layer is created uh, within milliseconds as the current passes through the conductive me medium, uh, which means uh, through the saline. So it's a very quick process. Uh, this uh, plasma layer is very thin. As you can see, its, thin its uh, thickness is about uh, 100 to 200 microns around the active electrode. Uh, the uh, excited sodium, uh, which is a byproduct of the process, accounts for the orange glow that you can see here. Uh, uh, when you use uh, the tool, you can see sometimes these orange spots, and this is uh, uh, due to this uh, excited sodium. So it's not uh, heat, it's not a thermal color, it's just linked with the, the uh, excitation of the sodium ion. So what is plasma? Plasma is a state of matter, uh, as well as fluid and gas. So. Uh, it's used in, uh, of course, in many applications besides uh, medicine. Uh, and you see there is a possibility to exchange bet uh, between the, uh, the, uh, the gas and the plasma state. Plasma formation is associated with the production of free hydroxyl radicals and free electrons. 
which are highly energi uh, energized particles which can break the intermolecular bones within molecules uh, in the target tissues. So uh, this rupture, uh, this break uh, of the intermolecular bones uh, uh, enables tissue removal. During the process, some gases are, are produced, and this explains why you can uh, see uh, why you can see some gas bubbles uh, during coblations. It is due to the production of oxygen and hydrogen. Associated with the coblation, there is also a coagulation system, which is uh, embedded in the same tool. Uh, it is located at the tip of the cublation shaft uh, and there is also a saline which is uh, irrigated during the use of the cublation and which is also provided by the same tool, by the same shaft. So uh, the coagulation system consists in uh, giving a low, uh, in applying a low intensity current uh, which is applied through the tissues. And this current is not large enough uh, to produce plasma. So ions and molecules uh, of the tissue absorb the energy, uh, causing the tissue particles to vibrate, uh, resulting in heat generations. And so this is how the coagulation system uh, functions. Uh, an important practical point is that if you want to increase uh, the, the, the efficiency of your coagulation, you can, of course, increase the amount of time that you use the coagulation on the target tissue. You can increase uh, the coagulation settings. Uh, the default setting is three, but you can go, uh, of course, beyond three uh, using four, five, and so on. And another important point is that uh, your coagulation will also be more efficient if you apply a greater pressure on the tissue. This is, an, you really have to, to press, to push the tissue if you want the coagulation to work better. Uh, regarding the temperatures associated with the coagulation, as you can see on this slide, um, using the, uh, the coagulation, uh, you uh, reach about 70 uh, Celsius degrees and using the coblation mode with the uh, yellow pedal, you only reach 40 uh, degrees. So these are rather uh, low temperatures. You, don't ha you have really little uh, damage due to heat uh, using coblation. And this is one, of course, this is one of the great advantages of these instruments. Here you can see by comparison, if you compare with a conventional electrosurgical device, with, the, with this conventional device, you reach temperatures like 40 to 6, uh, 4, 000, 400, sorry, to 6,000 degrees. And with coblations, as I told you, only 40 to 70 degrees. So, since you have a very thin plasma layer of only uh, 102,000 micron and a limited thermal diffusion, while well, you have a very precise tissue ablation and an optimal preservation of the tissues which surround your target tissues. So this is a very delicate tool. So now uh, uh, regarding the shaft, which is called the wand, uh, as I already told you, you have an integrated suction, saline irrigation, uh, and ablation and co coagulation. It's an all-in-one instrument. The, the shaft is malleable. You can bend it. There are many types, many different types, uh, many different models of shaft. Uh, which are adapted to the type of surgery that you want to use, uh, also to the age of the patients and so on. For instance, you can have a, a triple wire filament, uh, which was uh, the, the original uh, filament that was used to remove, uh, uh, to, to coblate uh, uh, tonsils and adenoids. But you can also have uh, a screen, uh, a screen uh, uh, extremity, 
with different uh, size and different properties, different potencies. Uh, so the screens are associated with less frequent obstruction of the suction canal, and uh, they have an increased durability as compared to the classical filament. Uh, you can al also have shafts with different malleability. This is, for instance, the halo shaft, which can be bent up to 90 degrees of angle. You can have different e irrigation system. Here, the saline goes uh, at this level. And uh, uh, with this other precise XP model, the saline is uh, 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 irrigated through these small holes that you can see. Uh, also, you can have uh, different ablation potencies. So, uh, so uh, I already told you this. Some uh, shafts are associated with a higher potency and with a, a quicker uh, tissue removal. There is also a, a coblation controller that you can see here on the right part of the slide. The classical one is the coblator 2 controller. You also have a, a flow control valve unit and a cable, and as well as a foot control unit. The blue pedal uh, uh, corresponds to the coagulation and the uh, uh, yellow pedal to the ablation. Uh, as I already told you, the default setting is uh, seven for ablation and three for coagulation. Uh, so now there is a more, more recent system, which is particularly useful, I think, for uh, endonasal uh, surgery. It's the, it is the halo wand and uh, with the werewolf system. So this new system is associated with less frequent clogging due to a reinforced wind shaft preventing kinks and a new tip clearing stylet. So you can use a stylet when uh, your shaft is, is obstructed, you can use a, a stylet in order to disobstruct the shaft. There is an additional backside electrode uh, which uh, can uh, coagulate. So it's, uh, it is rather very useful uh, to coagulate the tissue uh, from the back uh, of the tip of the electrode, of the shaft, sorry. And uh, the, the, there is, uh, the, the, the electrode is more, uh, has more, uh, has a higher sorry, durability. Uh, this, the, the, uh, there is a small cutting tip thickness, which uh, enables to be more precise in your surgery. And uh, as I already told you, the shaft can be bent up to 90 degrees. There is also an integrated pump for saline irrigation. And there, is, there are three levels of coagulation. And uh, regarding ablation, there is a high mode for debulking and a med mode, an, an intermediate mode for fine dissection. So you can see here the high mode and the med mode. So you have several levels of coagulations and several levels of ablation with this new system. So this is a, a, a great improvement, I think. So thank you very much uh, regarding the, uh, this int uh, introduction. Uh, I don't know if uh, you have any question to ask. Okay, I don't think so. So uh, I think that now I will give the floor uh, to the second speaker, Mrs. Anastasia Rashmanidou, uh, who is a, a, an ENT consultant in uh, uh, Lewisham and Greenwich hospitals in London. Uh, Anastasia. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I would like to thank uh, uh, Smith and Nephew for inviting me again to contribute to, uh, to a, one of the webinars. Um, and um, I, I really enjoy uh, the nasal forum. I'm an ENT consultant uh, with um, an interest in rhinology and pediatric ENT. Therefore, I have used the wand for um, a number of years. Um, and Let's hope well, I have my first slide when I get it. We will get it right. Apologies. I'm yes. So this is a, a, a view of Lewisham Hospital on a good day. 
at least it is not raining. We have a hot day in London today, and I hope most of the parts of the world, despite COVID, enjoy a sunny day. Uh, a sunny day comes with um, a lot of nasal obstruction due to allergic rhinitis, uh, hay fever sufferers. So our talks um, should be relevant to the time of the year, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, and going back to our subject of the inferior turbinate, uh, we shouldn't forget uh, this tissue um, is, uh, has a, a very rich blood supply uh, and it has a ciliated respiratory epithelium um, as, as the mucosal lining. It is very important in the warming and filtering of the air that we breathe. We know that in order to avoid complications, we should keep the lining intact if possible. Um, I, I did experiment when I, when I uh, was at the beginning of the training, um, we would do turbinectomies, um, taking the scissors to the turbinates. Thereafter, we, a very popular method was the submucosal diathermy or laser mucotomy. And we have experienced complications as adhesions uh, due to damaging of mucosal lining. Um, so we shouldn't also forget that um, um, the nose has a depth and the inferior turbinate has a, um, a length of at least seven centimeters uh, in an adult. So extends in all this length. And uh, having an instrument that can reach this level without issues is very important. I will talk to you today about the Reflex 45, which is, um, I would say, the, the turbinate wand. Um, there were modifications of this. There was a Reflex 55 more for snoring cases and more for acepalatal wand. Um, the Reflex 45, the difference uh, from uh, what Professor Colonia has already explained is, is that in other ones we have an irrigation system and in a Reflex 45 we do not have an irrigation system. And if you noticed from his important presentation, uh, the, the role of the saline um, as a medium uh, in, uh, in the radio frequency and activation of sodium ion is very important. If we don't have sodium ions, um, our coblator does not work. So we have to be careful here and provide some medium when we use the wand. Now, how do our patients uh, present in, in the clinics? We might have an adult rhinology clinic that I will go through first or a pediatric rhinology clinic and they uh, present as, as nasal obstruction or snoring. Uh, sometimes mentioned and sometimes hidden in the referrals, but the patient comes also due to snoring. Um, the problem is, or might be, septal deviation and inferior turbinate hypertrophy, or only inferior turbinate hypertrophy that may be coexisting with allergic rhinitis or idiopathic rhinitis, or it could be a more complex case of external nasal deviation and septal deviation and the turbinate hypertrophy, or it could be a post-septal rhinoplasty case where um, we have been very keen with osteotomies, but we have created a narrow nose. So different scenarios, different presentations. We have always uh, the task to assess with nasal endoscopy, assess the nasal valve, uh, do skin prick testing and or RAS testing. Uh, confirm or exclude coexisting rhinosinusitis with or without nasal polyps, and eventually tailor the procedure to the patient's needs. We will discuss today how we can do a uh, reduction of the inferior turbinates uh, using the Reflex 45 wand. Uh, it can be under local anesthetic and direct vision, uh, it, which, which I find challenging because we can't really um, assess the full length of the turbinate. 
uh, it could be under local anesthetic with a rigid endoscope, which is now preferable for many, many reasons, um, including COVID, because having, having an endoscope and doing uh, your work through a screen increases the distance between the doctor and the patient. For obvious reasons, we have less risk of, um, uh, of um, um, infection. Or we can do this case um, under general anesthetic as part of a bigger procedure, as part of our septoplast intermittent reduction, either under direct or uh, under direct vision or using an endoscope. I will discuss with you the technique. And th there are two steps in the technique. Uh, we will discuss just the simple reduction of the turbinet. Uh, with the reflex 45, and then we will discuss uh, the uh, coblation turbinoplasty, endoscopic turbinoplasty. So if you want to do it under GA, um, again, it is your preference. You can try under local using neuropathies um, in co-phenylcaine spray. Uh, you could even use 5% cocaine for topical application. You have to be very careful with, um, uh, with legislation in different countries and the patient's occupation, and the patient has to be fully informed that there is medicinal use of cocaine, and you have to have the patient's consent. Uh, don't forget, you might be treating athletes, pilots, uh, firemen. They might be subjects to uh, regular testing, so they need to be informed. Uh, the top tip, uh, is to, to provide the medium that I discussed earlier, uh, inject the turbinate with some normal saline. So you optimize, so you give the medium, so you optimize the wants fun function. Uh, it is, I would leave it to each surgeon to decide if they want to infiltrate with a lignospan, um, assessing the risks versus the benefits. And there is one case of a blindness uh, via the internal carotid artery. So be extra careful when you inject with lignospan, but it is the, the doctor's preference. Um, and when you use the reflex 45 to create your channels, avoid crossover of your channels. So you enter the inferior turbinet from the anterior part, from the caudal end, and then you go in the full length, preferably check in with your endoscope where you are, but avoid crossing over and avoid touching the periosteum of, of the os turbinalis. If you touch the periosteum, your patient is complaining of a burning sensation. Uh, you have to have a very good scrub nurse to help you, particularly if you're doing this under local anesthetic. Very important to clean the tip of the wand before each pass. Um, use use a, a clean, wet gauze and not an abrasive sponge. Um, Every, every time you, you do a pass, um, have a small gully port with normal saline and test the tip of your wand and see the glow before it's passed uh, because it, uh, every small clot that can sit at the tip of your wand may affect the performance of the wand. Um, and we have to give special attention to the tail of the inferior turbinate. Most of the times we have these uh, big grape-like um, uh, tails of the turbinate and, and it is amazing how well they can shrink uh, under endoscopic view uh, using the reflex 45 at the back. So um, attention to the orientation again, um, try not to come out of the lining of the turbinate. Um, easily you might touch the septum um, if you just made the septoplasty and you have a mucosal tear, you may induce adhesions. When you're treating an allergic patient this time of the year, so during the, um, the spring and summer months, um, because sometimes we don't choose when we treat the patients, particularly in the NHS, um, then you have to be um, uh, very clear with the preoperative management and, and have a good preoperative medication for this patient. Uh, this time of the year, allergic patients tend to bleed. So keep calm. Uh, use some packs, um, apply pressure for just a few minutes and it will stop. Um, Post-operatively, you can use, particularly in COVID times, in order to avoid hospital admissions, uh, you can use a soft sponge uh, pack like um, a, a dissolvable nasopore uh, or, uh, or any other type of dissolvable um, gel pack um, in the nose so that you can discharge your patient. 
other cases, um, the more complex cases could be uh, revision cases. So they had um, a, a reduction of inferior turbulence before, uh, and they come back after a few years. It could be, as I said, a septorhinoplasty um, with a very narrow nose, or indeed nasal valve issues that will not be completely solved with uh, an inferior turbinate reduction, but you can buy some space. Uh, you, might, you may have to treat coexisting adhesions due to previous surgery, um, and also um, severe posterior septal deviation with the inferior turbinate hypertrophy, or you may combine the inferior turbinate uh, reduction with uh, eustachian uh, balloon tuboplasty. So I will explain how we do um, an endoscopic turbinoplasty. Uh, and I think it is um, easier probably if uh, I go straight to the video and I will talk you through uh, the video. So uh, let's imagine that we have injected the inferior turbinate with normal saline. I use a, a 15 blade for a small incision in the anterior part of the inferior turbinate, which is my entry point. Uh, thereafter, I take a Frias elevator and um, under direct vision, uh, under the endoscopic vision, um, I elevate the mucosal lining from the turbinate bone, the osturbinalis, creating a channel. And I use then this entry point to introduce my, uh, my wand, my reflex 45. Initially, I would go and create channels in a linear mode in the whole length of the turbinate. Uh, more recently, I started using the wand to go in a fish bone mode uh, stepwise approach. So I go up and down and up and down and up and down pointing more to the midline, pointing more to the septum, so I can really see the tip of my uh, reflex 45. And you can literally um, um, see the, the, the tissue shrinking before your eyes. So you can see the blanching. Can you see now how I move this mucosal lining away from the oster turbinalis? I know when I have the plume, I know that I have bridged mucosa. So I'm, I'm very careful. Uh, having your nurse assistant uh, keeping the suction very close to their nostril is, uh, is also important because you, you have a clear view after that. And uh, you can reintroduce or you go, as I said, in a fishbone wide um, a, a approach to this. And you can reintroduce, as you see, um, in an inferior tunnel and you can target uh, very, very easily the posterior part of the inferior turbinate. This is the tail of the turbinate. I can, you can see a beautiful blanching uh, and you have to inform your patient that this will cause um, you know, dying of the tissue, it's necrosis of the tissue after a few days. So all the white slough that will come uh, when they have the uh, nasal douching uh, is not to be um, considered as an infection as many will say later on. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So consent is very important. Perioperative medication, very important. So if your patient is allergic, they need to, to be loaded with flixonase nasals or steroid nasals uh, beforehand. Um, and uh, very, uh, uh, very careful uh, instructions on a nasal douching twice a day after the surgery and nasal lubrication. Nasal lubrication will facilitate the, the SCARs to, uh, to fall easier rather than um, a, an ongoing need of nasal toilet with suction. And how do we um, go on about um, reduction of inferior turbulence in children? Uh, so this is a, a presentation in a European Rhinologic Society um, web, uh, uh, conference where we presented at the time 23 patients uh, aging from three years to 15 years. And we did not have any overnight admissions or readmissions. Uh, we had uh, very satisfactory comments by the parents. Um, and uh, we continued doing that and, and um, 
I, I see this method uh, gaining more and more and more popularity um, as it is easy. Um, it, it can be combined with adenoidectomy or in the older child, um, a septoplasty. Of course, this will not be the first line of treatment and medical treatment uh, when there is allergic rhinitis uh, should be followed uh, or adenoidectomy alone. First, uh, we should also address the cause of the uh, inferior turbinate hypertrophy and not only the outcome. Um, and preferably the age group that we should uh, use the pediatric uh, turbinate reduction should be over the age of five. With that, I conclude. I hope I was in my time allocation. Uh, thank you very much and happy to answer your questions either now or later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia, for this uh, very beautiful presentation. There was just one question regarding the, the quantity of saline that you inject. Uh, submucosously uh, before performing your turbinate. 10 mils, 10 mils divided into the two turbinates, so five mils each side. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. So maybe uh, due to uh, uh, our schedule, uh, I, I straight away give the floor to uh, Dr. Sam Leon uh, from Entry University Hospital uh, uh, in uh, Liverpool. Uh, Sam, uh, please. Thank you very much, Professor. And um, hello, everyone from actually a very sunny and warm London. I'm not in uh, Liverpool this afternoon, and I can assure you it is very sunny outside in London. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the turbinator. Um, I'm just going to check to see if the slides are going to work. There we go. Thank you very much. So disclosures. Um, now, for the next few minutes or so, uh, what I'm going to do is focus on the turbinator one, uh, and then in the next session, um, I will um, introduce you uh, to, the, to, to the setup in the labs. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, on how I do it. Uh, and, and, and certainly I've been using the, the Terminator ones for the last three to four years, and I'll share some technical tips and then finish off the presentation with uh, some clinical data. So we've heard uh, 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 Dr. Rachmanidos uh, speak about the uh, Reflex 45. Um, this is what the turbinator looks like. Um, it has an active pad at the front. Uh, the, the settings are default seven and three. Uh, it is a 2.9 millimeter diameter shaft, so it's much thicker uh, than the Reflex 45 uh, by about twice, really, in terms of diameter. You can see the um, active pad there. Uh, and then there's also de uh, depth gauges, and, and the depth gauge uh, tells you uh, how, how deep you are within the substance of the turbinate, and each gauge is uh, 15 millimeters, 1.5 centimeters. Yeah? And at the back of the turbinator one, uh, and I'll show you again once we, we, we transition the cameras to the lab, um, the irrigation ports, which is at the back uh, of the one that provides uh, that plasma feel. So how I do it, step one, um, I almost always will inject some, some local anesthetic to the uh, head of the inferior turbinate. Uh, this provides um, uh, easier access to the uh, 11 blade in terms of making a stab incision right down to bone. Um, and that helps in terms of creating a tunnel or a channel. Yeah? Um, and then inserting the turbinator one, and you can appreciate um, how uh, the size of the turbinator one in, in, in relation to the, uh, the turbinate. And you're essentially running the turbinator one alongside the turbinate bone to create that channel. Um, if you perforate the mucosa, that's okay. Um, and this is very important because you can see the notch there on your handpiece, and the notch indicates where the active pad is. Yeah? So you can actually rotate uh, the turbinator one uh, to direct where the active pad ought to be, whether it's submucosally or on the turbinate bone. 
And then once you, you, you've, you've gained the, the sufficient depth, uh, you, you, you step on the ablate pedal and you withdraw the wand slowly. Um, and you can also coagulate the incision site to ensure that there is hemostasis at the end of the operation. And you can see that minor blanching of the mucosa there, yeah? So I do all my turbinoplasties using the coblator uh, under endoscopic guidance. Um, and I'll, again, I'll show you uh, the irrigation pump when we transition to the lab. Uh, but I almost always will, will leave the uh, irrigation on a medium setting. Um, suction is uh, between 250 to 250 uh, millimeter mercury, which essentially in the, in the NHS hospital, it's maximum suction uh, capacity. Uh, and typically after two passes of the turbinator wand, uh, I will remove the wand uh, from the turbinator and have the scrubness give it a really good clean. Um, laterally, um, I, I undertake a, a three pass technique. Uh, the first part is on the turbinate bone, and I'll, I'll show you why. So this is, this is a video of uh, the procedure concluding. Um, and, and I think if you pass the, 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 uh, the turbinator onto the bone initially, it allows you to, to do that. You see, you can literally squish the turbinate right down at the end of the procedure, and that, that obviously enhances uh, the nasal patency. Uh, the second and third passes are typically submucosally, uh, and if you do perforate the mucosa, uh, that is okay. Um, all it is really is to remind yourself uh, wherever you've perforated the mucosa uh, that you coagulate that part of the mucosa, and, and, and hence uh, quite important if you're able to, uh, to undertake the procedure endoscopically so that you can actually see where mucosa has been perforated. Um, Ideally, you will have just one perforation, which is at the front of the inferior turbinate where the incision was made. Uh, but sometimes you have thinner mucosa more posteriorly. Um, and, and, and if it did perforate, just remind yourself to coagulate that part of the mucosa just to ensure that you do not have post-operative hemorrhage. So let's have a look at um, some clinical data. So this was the first paper that was published about four years ago now. And essentially, the authors looked at their early experience uh, and compared that with a similar group of patients uh, who had the microdebrider turbinoplasty technique. So they compared 22 patients with uh, the coblator, uh, uh, sorry, turbinator versus uh, another 22 patients who've had their turbin inf uh, inferior turbinate reduction surgery using uh, the microdebrider. And essentially, they were looking at um, um, uh, uh, symptomatic uh, improvement. And you can see preoperatively, um, the orange bar is the turbinator, the, gray, the dark gray bar is the microdebrider, and the preoperative group uh, are, are very similar in terms of how severe the nasal obstruction was. And postoperatively, um, 12 weeks later, you can see the the comparable outcomes there, uh, and also very significant improvement uh, at 12 weeks. Um, they also looked at nasal airflow, uh, and you can see preoperatively, uh, both cohorts were very similar in, in um, having poor nasal airflow, and you can see at, at 12 weeks, significant improvement uh, in, in airflow that, that's been established. And you can also see how comparable uh, the turbinator is um, to the microdebrider technique. Um, what was more important was the authors uh, noted that um, the, in the turbinator group, um, there was no change in the nasal bolster. And, and the nasal bolster is typically applied uh, after the procedure. And what the, the authors uh, observed really was that these patients would leave hospital after a day case procedure leave the hospital with the same nasal bolster that the surgeon had placed on the patient at the end of the operation. They also realized that there was no packing required um, and, and there was no hospital readmission. Uh, and when they compared that with the microdebrider cohort, certainly with that particular cohort, um, uh, all their patients required some form of nasal packing and there was a smaller number of patients who returned uh, within 20, uh, 12 to 24 hours of their procedure with epistaxis. This is a, 
this is a very common question that, that I, I get asked, uh, which is better, the Reflex 45 or the Terminator? And actually, in, in my opinion, uh, it's, it's actually having to understand the, 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 the differences in, in how the technology is being delivered, but that hasn't stopped uh, some of our colleagues overseas from, from evaluating this. And uh, there have been two studies, one based in Turkey, uh, the other in, in India. Um, so the first, uh, the first study uh, that was published, uh, this was in Turkey, and essentially they compared two cohorts, um, uh, one with the Reflex Ultra and the other with the Turbinator, and essentially the conclusion was it was comparable outcomes at three to four months post-op. Um, they realized um, that the Reflex Ultra uh, is more suited for a local anesthetic procedure, um, uh, whilst the Turbinator almost invariably has to be done under general anesthetic. When we looked at um, the Indian study, um, they followed the uh, cohort up right up to 12 months. Uh, and again, they, they compared two cohorts, one having the Reflex Ultra 45 versus the Turbinator. And you can see here, uh, the blue line being the Turbinator and the orange being the uh, Reflex Ultra, um, that there is early uh, improvement, uh, but ultimately both are comparable in terms of outcomes. So certainly, uh, my, my, my final uh, remarks on, on the Terminator, having used it consistently now for the past four years, uh, is that there is very, very little in the way of bleeding. Um, uh, patients who, who get seen uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the first three to four weeks post-op report significantly less crusting uh, in the nasal cavity compared to patients who, who typically have the microdebrider uh, technique. Um, we have... Uh, um, not had to, 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 to readmit any patients. All our patients are day case procedure. And overall, um, the, the patient experience have been, been very, very positive. And certainly in my practice, um, having done the, 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 an internal audit, the clinical outcomes are very, very predictable with the Turbinator. So I certainly have no, um, you know, uh, no reservations in, in terms of recommending it and that you should try using the Turbinator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we might answer some questions uh, uh, of the attendees, we, we, especially regarding this uh, uh, infinite turbinate surgery. Um, so, uh, Basem, uh, no, there is a, uh, there is a, so, um, Etesham uh, Kereshi, who asks, what are the markings uh, with the Reflex 45, Anastasia? What are the markings for, and how long do you uh, do you have to press the pedal uh, while using uh, uh, the Reflex 45 at a given point? I can only speculate that the markings are for the length of the, the depth of the tissue that you are, as they are for the turbinator. And knowing that beyond seven centimeters, we are somewhere that we shouldn't be, uh, that, that is probably to, uh, to say how deep one must be. Uh, the second question is how long? Uh, not uh, approximately 10 seconds going in. And the dispute is... Um, do we press the pedal as we come out? And I like pressing the pedal as I come out too. Um, so it might be the whole uh, of um, 15, 15 seconds, more or less. Okay. Uh, now somebody asked how to avoid the blockage of suction for turbinate when? Some how Sorry. to how to avoid blockage of the suction port blockage of the suction port on the turbinator um ensuring that after two passes um you you, you remove it from the turbine and have your scrub nurse uh, give it a really good clean and very similar in terms of using uh, a coblation wand say for the tonsils where you would activate the tip of the wand in some saline just to get some of that soft tissue uh, being burnt off really um Okay. Uh, another question, is turbinator wand effective in uh, treating patients with ITH? So, what do you think, Dr. Leon? 
It's, um, do you think there is uh, any difference in the indications of uh, the use of uh, Reflex 45 and the Terminator regarding this uh, inferior turbinate surgery? Uh, Can... in, in... Sorry, go ahead, Anastasia. Sorry. No, no, no. Can I, I, I wanted some clarification of the question, so I will, I will hear your take on this. Yes. Are there some specific indications of turbinator and specific indications of Reflex 45, or can they be applied to the same kind of situations? I think it is surgeon's preference and, and how one feels. And I would say, judging, of, of course, in pediatric cases, I would like to, uh, to use the pediatric Reflex 45 version, right? Because it is smaller, it is slicker, Turbinator has a certain volume, as some um, um, clearly um, uh, told us the measurements. Uh, so I would probably uh, say I would use that for adult use. And again, depends what size of turbinate we are talking about. Uh, so it is every case is an individual case, and you will have to judge on on the patient's needs. So if you have a very delicate female, fair skin, tiny nose. Um, I would be rather skeptical using the turbinator. Again, maybe in my hands, it would not work very well. Maybe I would have torn the mucosa. I wouldn't choose the turbinator maybe in somebody who has abused uh, nasal vasoconstrictors because I will have very friable mucosa. And I wouldn't want to touch the turbinates for, for at least three months post stopping of using uh, this, uh, these sprays. Uh, but, but then again, it is, I think, what works in the surgeon's hands. Okay. Okay. Um, there is another question. Uh, why would you turn the turbinator towards the bone of turbinate? Um, as I showed in the video, um, uh, my first pass is, is to ablate the, uh, the turbinate bone, which then allows me at the end of the procedure to outfracture uh, the turbinate much more easily. And, and I think ablating the turbinate bone a little bit, certainly in your first pass, uh, reduces that integrity uh, of the bone that then allows you to, to outfracture more easily. Okay. Uh, and obviously when you're tunneling, sometimes you might get um, uh, bleeding from the bone itself and certainly ablating it uh, would stop that as well. Okay. Somebody asked, is there any data regarding posterior bleeding using the Reflex 45 and how can it be managed? The only data that I have, um, you know, firm data from our pediatric um, study and we didn't have any readmission. Um, uh, the, uh, what I do now routinely, uh, but only in COVID times, before, before I would never pack a nose. Uh, now uh, we, um, I'm using um, a half, half a nasal pore per nostril. It is just a light padding of the standard nasal pore, which is very soft. Uh, so it is a soft dissolvable sponge and that keeps me absolutely on the safe side. That is a guarantee. The patient will not come during night. Uh, the patient has enough space to breathe. They don't bleed. Okay. Sam, any, any comments on that? What do you... um, I, I never pack my noses and, and um, post-operatively, uh, and it's a badge of honor uh, not to pack the noses. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly the, 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 the readmission rates from post-op apistaxis from turbinate reduction surgery can be low and will be low if you pay attention to where the the, the mucosa is in size when you insert the wand. So take a bit of time to get some coagulation around that particular area. Number one. Number two, if as you're channeling, and it, regardless whether you use the turbinator or the reflex 45, as you're channeling, if you perforate the mucosa in, in the middle parts or in the posterior parts of the inferior turbinate, don't worry, just ensure and remind yourself uh, that, that those areas there also need to be coagulated. Uh, and certainly by doing that and being a little bit more meticulous with, with, with that particular step, uh, it, it's kept our readmission rates very, very low. And that also means that postoperatively, your patients don't complain too much about nasal crusting. Because sometimes you can get you know, slow mucosal bleeds that, that, that then dries up into a clot. And a final question before we move on is uh, what, what is the minimal age 
uh, that we can use uh, Reflex 45, Anastasia, I think you already said it, but... Yes, I said I would prefer over the age of five. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't like the idea of a three-year-old. Um, some people do it. I don't do it happily. Uh, I think there are other reasons that a three-year-old has nasal congestion. Okay, yes, you're right. Okay, so I think that maybe uh, we can go on with uh, you, Sam. Uh, Thank you. Please. So welcome back uh, to London. We are now uh, transitioned to the labs. Um, and what I want to show you is the two ones. Um, the first one here, and I'll just use something to point. Um, this is the, the turbinator one. Um, and this is the active pad here. The irrigation ports are at the back. Um, these are the gradations here, and they are separated uh, by, um, by distance of 15 millimeters, so 1.5 centimeters. Uh, someone asked about the gradations of the reflex um, 45, and it's similar, yeah? 15 millimeters there, okay? So I'm just gonna, gonna focus on the coblation one now. Um, and we're going to now, um, and this, this, this one is essentially plug and play. So we'll transition very quickly to a camera that's focusing on the power console. And you can see, as soon as you plug it in, uh, a, uh, a blade is seven, coagulate is three. Um, I've never been, been, been tempted in any way to change those settings. Those settings are more than sufficient uh, to do uh, what I needed to do for the inferior turbinate. Sitting above the power console is the um, a pump, uh, and, and, and this pump is specific uh, to the turbinator. And for those of you who, who recognize um, the coblation pump, whenever you do tonsil surgery, will instantly recognize it. this looks a little bit different. Um, and in terms of setting up the pump, uh, it just requires a little bit of training, but it's, it's very, very straightforward as well. So we have the camera back here. So I'm just going to show you what happens to the coblation tip when I step on the pedal. And you can see irrigations coming up from that part, the port at the back here. And I'll just show you what happens when we put it on soft tissue. And this is a blade. Yeah. And the key really is, is ensuring that you move it around rather than, than stay on one spot. Yeah. Now I'm going to press coagulate and I'll show you. Yeah. Slightly different effects on soft tissue there. And if you remember, remember from the first presentation, um, you appreciate the power settings are all a little bit different. Hence the effect on soft tissue and depth is also very, very different. Okay. So uh, I'm going to now transition to the endoscope picture. So let me just give you some orientation as to what we've set up in the lab here. Uh, we've got uh, a plastic silicon model here. Um, this structure here obviously uh, holds the, the soft tissue in. And for today's demonstration, uh, we're using uh, a piece of beef um, to simulate um, the turbinate. So uh, very similar to the video I demonstrated earlier, uh, it's a stab incision with an 11 blade um, at the, uh, the head of the inferior turbinate, um, right down onto bone. Yeah? And that's all I do. So a single stab incision. Um, and if I don't perforate the mucosa, this is the only area that will bleed uh, during the operation. And if I do not coagulate, then this is the area that might bleed postoperatively or certainly be the area where I find crusting when the patient returns to clinic at three to four weeks post-op. And then we're now going to insert the inferior turbinate, uh, the turbinator one. And again, I'm just going to remind everyone that the notch in the handpiece here tells you where the active pad is facing. Yeah. So you see, initially it is facing medially. And as you're tunneling it in, you'll see from the other camera um, how things are 
looking. And you can see the depth there. So we're literally at the third band. So we are approximately um, four and a half centimeters in. And, and doing this um, endoscopically then allows you to inspect where the tip of the turbinator might be, whether it's still within the substance of the turbinate or has it perforated, yeah? Um, so again, let's step on the ablate pedal. And as you do that, you can slowly withdraw. Yeah, there we go. And rather than take it out completely, what I tend to do is at the incision site, I just coagulate a little bit just to ensure that the step incision area is, um, I will stop bleeding. Yeah, and then another channel. So the channel will, will certainly be dependent on what your endoscopic uh, assessment is, but typically the second um, channel that I will, I will make would be aiming inferiorly uh, to the free, uh, free edge of the inferior turbinate. There you go. And again, ablate. And then finally, uh, typically at this stage, I'll take it out have it cleaned by my scrub nurse, and then reinsert it for the final pass. And that also provides an opportunity to then inspect um, the level of ablation that's been affected on the turbulent. But typically, a third pass will be more superiorly. Um, and again, uh, before I take it out, it gives, you, gives, gives the, the, the operating surgeon an, an ability to inspect the incision site. And if there is any need to coagulate, you can coagulate again. And then the procedure is then finished uh, with outfracturing um, the inferior turbinate. Okay. Any questions so far before we transition to the reflex 45? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. So there was just some somebody asking what what but it's not really a technical question but when is the best time for follow up to clean for the uh, to clean the crustacean postoperatively? Um so so after transitioning uh, from the microdebrider to the turbinator uh, I still see my patients about 3 to 4 weeks after their operation but the number of times uh, we have had to undertake uh, debridement in clinic has, has come down to literally nothing, which makes my, the life of my fellow very, very pleasant indeed, because typically debridement of the nose is passed on to the fellow next door. Um, so, yeah. And because patients then undertake saline, uh, saline nasal irrigation as soon as they, they leave hospital, um, um, the, the, the amount of crusting that, that then results in symptoms is actually very, very low and very uncommon, certainly in my, my clinics. Okay. And there is another uh, attendee who, uh, who says, if, uh, you, uh, if you injure the periosteum while directing the turbinator towards the bone, is there any evidence that this causes crusting, etc., as I understand okay. from Reflex 45 talk? So um, we have never experienced uh, necrosis of the inferior turbinate with the turbinator. Uh, very different experiences when we were still using the SMD needle, where every third or every fourth patient will have significant sloughing of the mucosa, which ends up being necrosis uh, or partial necrosis of the inferior turbinate. Certainly with the turbinator, um, and in the last four years that we've used it consistently for our day case uh, procedures, uh, not one of our patients have had uh, necrosis of the inferior turbinate. Okay. Yes, I think we can move on, so Sam. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the, the uh, Reflex 45. So um, I'm just going to put the endoscope down. And again, I'm just going to show you uh, what the tip looks like. And you can see it, it hasn't got um, the irrigation port to this. Um, these markings here tell you how deep you are within the uh, inferior turbinate. And this again is a plug and play instrument and we'll just go on to the power console to show you, there you go. So this is the default setting for the Reflex 45, it's four and two. And certainly uh, when I was using this uh, regularly, we've never needed to change the settings whatsoever. Um, so we can come back to uh, this camera now. And I'll just show you, so you can see how 
um, the soft tissue previously was affected by the turbinator. And alongside that, I'm just going to show you, and I might just need to put some saline here so that there's a plasma field. And this is a blade. Yeah. And you can see it is slightly narrower in terms of the ablation of soft tissue compared to the turbinator. Yeah. But that's because the turbinator is a 2.9 millimeter diameter uh, instrument. Yeah. And it, this is what it looks like when you coagulate mucosa. Okay. Now, let's transition ourselves to the endoscope, because I'll then show you how I typically will do it. So again, um, this is a, a simulator inferior turbinate, uh, step incision uh, with an 11 uh, blade, again, right down uh, onto bone, and you stay medial uh, to the turbinate bone. And this area here will typically bleed. But that gives you an opportunity that when you start, you can always coagulate this area here just to stop the bleeding. And then you insert based on the depth indicator. And then you can also check uh, endoscopically. Yeah? And again, uh, you, you ought to be checking whether you've perforated mucosa. And if you have, uh, remind yourself to coagulate. Okay. So again, when you, when you step on the ablate uh, pedal, withdraw this slowly. Uh, and typically, um, you, know, you will come to the, to the, to the end or the, to the tip of the instrument within 10 seconds. Yeah? You can keep it in, in the incision uh, point, and then you can make another channel. Uh, and, and it's either superior or inferior, depending on where you, you feel um, the mucosa is hypertrophic. Okay? So let's assume we, we're going to go superiorly there. And we're going to press, press the plate and withdraw slowly again. And then one final pass. And, and, and I, I tend to go three passes, do three passes uh, with, all, uh, with all of these cases. Certainly with the reflex uh, 45, there is, uh, uh, there is no need to remove the, uh, the one uh, between the second and third passes because you can see there is no charring on the tip of um, uh, the instrument. And obviously, this, there's no suction to this, so it, it won't get blocked. So, so a slightly different um, uh, technique, but with the turbinator, just remind yourself to remove it after the second pass, have it cleaned thoroughly by your scrub nurse before you finish the procedure. Okay, any questions? There's some, um, I have a slightly different experience uh, in the sense that sometimes you get a little clot. Yes, you don't have suction, but you might get a little clot. And if that stays at the tip of your wand, the reflex 45 then becomes ineffective. Mm. So, and that's why I say clean it with, dip it in the gully pot, make sure it is glowing. It is glowing, it's fine, you can carry on. It is not glowing, just wipe it with a wet swab. It doesn't need, it, it needs very gentle handling and it works very well. It doesn't need a, a lot of effort or scratch pads, um, but it might, it might, it might have a little clot. Okay, there is another question. Nice demo. How many times do you have to repeat this procedure before you get a good result? What is the learning co curve? Is that question for me or? Yes, so Sam. Okay. <laughs> so with regard to the turbinator, our, our revision rates um, uh, are, are less than one percent actually. So so we, we undertake uh, approximately about a hundred uh, of these procedures, day case procedures, uh, pre-COVID anyway, per annum. Uh, certainly in my practice alone, um, and 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 of that, uh, we, we we certainly don't have. Um, very high numbers of patients coming back within the first 18 months uh, requiring a repeat procedure. What I tell all these patients really is that the procedure can be repeated and, 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 and because um, we haven't dealt with the actual dry driver for inferior turbulent hypertrophy to occur, say for example, allergic rhinitis, 
uh, then one would expect the mucosa over time uh, to, to be congested again, to be hypertrophic again. And certainly, uh, I, don't, I don't try and make it sound as though the procedure has failed. Um, certainly in, in the consultations, uh, it's made very clear that the that, that, that clinical outcome uh, uh, may deteriorate over time and may require revision surgery, which is something that, that, that you know, patients are, 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 are more than eligible to have, really. Okay. Um, there is a, a question for you, Anastasia. Is it normal to see no shrinkage intraoperatively with ultra uh, with reflex ultra forty five? Sorry, is it not? Is it normal you... not to see a mucosal shrinkage? It is normal to see. Uh, it is ideal to see. You, it is more reassuring if you see it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't see it. If you have very thick mucosa, you you may not see it. It doesn't mean that you're failing, okay. but if you, if you see the blanching, if you see the shrinking, it is, it is very reassuring that you are in the right plane, but sometimes you have huge turbinates and maybe there it is where you will definitely go for the turbinator rather than the reflex 45. Reflex 45 is, I would say, more gentle touch to it. Um, and, and maybe in the, in the previous question to some, um, uh, the, it was that the question not necessarily for how long the procedure is effective for. Uh, is it the number of cases that one could be competent to yes. then? That's the learning curve, yes. Yes, the learning curve. So the learning curve is, uh, is operator dependent. It is, not always, uh, it is not always a specific number for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for all. Uh, we had agreed in the past that for tonsillectomy it should be 50. Um, I would say, you know, at least 30 cases, and you don't have to hold somebody's hand, um, you learn, uh, you, you can observe it, um, you can go and watch a colleague doing it, um, you can have a mentorship program, uh, maybe uh, I'm attending a theater list, uh, but um, then you, you go on and do it, and as you learn driving your own car, you learn driving your own coblation machine. Okay. Can I just add about the learning curve? Uh, um, like I said, we've done this for the last four or five years now. We, we have um, rhinology fellows coming to us every year. And certainly my observation really is that the learning curve in terms of the fellows picking this up and being able to do it then independently is about 10, 10 to 12, no more than that. And in the initial um, uh, learning curve is almost always focused on the setting up and understanding what irrigation and suction does and reminding oneself uh, to give the tip of the, uh, the turbinator a really good clean because um, without cleaning it uh, properly, uh, it, it, the suction does get blocked uh, and it renders uh, the wand ineffective. But, but certainly the, the setting up is, is the one thing that I've observed uh, which, 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 is, which is most prominent in that learning curve period. But once they get up and running, uh, it, it's a very simple procedure. Okay. Maybe we have time for last question. When uh, when do you use uh, general anesthesia, and when do you use and when do you prefer local anesthesia? In uh, are there any tips and tricks related to this? Maybe some you can. Uh... Um, so the only time, um, um, and then this this goes back to one of the questions that the, the delegates had asked earlier about choosing which one to use. Uh, and it's almost always driven by uh, the patient's choice of having either a local anesthetic procedure or a general anesthetic procedure. So certainly, if the patient decides that he or she wants a local anesthetic procedure, uh, then I would then certainly use the, the Reflex 45 because um, the, the coblator having a higher energy setting, uh, I don't think is suitable uh, for a local anesthetic procedure. Okay. Yeah. Agree to that, Sam. Um, I think it's much more um, e easy to use, um, um, much better control. And also the risk of bleeding on the uh, awake patient is much less, surprisingly, because there is, um, uh, there is tone to the tissue. Uh, in the relaxed patient under the GA, you may encounter even more bleeding that you don't see that much under local, but it is patient's preference. And now it should be doctors driven uh, it is a managing up technique where you have to sell the local anesthetic if you want to cut back the, the waiting list 
the waiting times with COVID, we have very long waiting times for a GA and we should maintain the GA for, for more complex procedures and for the simple uh, turbinate reduction we could do under lockup. Okay, so I think we have to move on and uh, maybe I will uh, make my presentations regarding uh, other uh, indications besides uh, turbinate reduction. So, up, I will try to start now. So, Sorry, I have to move back. So um, uh, indeed, uh, cublation can be used for endonasal uh, surgery in a number of indications. And I will just show uh, a, a, few, a few of them. Uh, I will show you a few of them. So for instance, uh, uh, entrocranial polyps, this is, um, this is done, all these procedures are done with a hollow, uh, with a hollow shaft. Uh, and the werewolf controller. And as I told you, it's uh, useful because you can bend it up to 90 degrees. Uh, it's very solid. So uh, uh, the duration, you can use it for a long period of time without uh, uh, any problem. And it's uh, rather also precise and uh, 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 the potency is also high. So it's, it's really, I think an improvement uh, compared to uh, previous models. So this is uh, Maximilien, for instance, who uh, is, was a 15-year-old, and I coblated uh, the uh, nentrocanal polyp using it. So you, you can see the polyp here coming out of the maxillary sinus. And you will see that uh, the coblation is uh, really efficient uh, uh, for, the, for any uh, polyps within the nose or sinus. It removes polyps very quickly. So of course you don't have to push too much uh, the shaft on the on the tissue. You just have uh, to uh, to gently uh, uh, get in in contact with the target tissue without uh, putting any pressure. And you have to move your shaft regularly and not to stay uh, in the same place uh, for too long. And uh, as was previously mentioned, of course. It is absolute, absolutely critical uh, that the shaft is not obstructed, so you have to uh, wash it regularly. And uh, again, this uh, halo system has a stilet, which is rather useful uh, to uh, disobstruct, uh, to avoid obstruction of the shaft. So now we are within uh, the maxillary sinus, and we can see uh, that uh, we uh, gently and progressively removed, removed the uh, the the the, uh, the part of the polyp which was inside the maxillary sinus, and uh, uh, in the anterior part of the sinus, the fact that you can bend the shaft up to ninety degrees is uh, extremely useful. Here I use a, a seventy degree angle uh, endoscope to uh, control to visually control the anterior part of the sinus. Okay, so this is it. Now the procedure is over, so I think I can just quit. And uh, now I will show you another example. It's a, a nine-year-old child with cystic fibrosis, and it's a very short movie to show you uh, uh, again how easily you can remove uh, nasal polyps or sinus uh, polyps with this uh, coblation system. You can see the orange glow indicating uh, the excitation the excitation of the sodium ion. So it, it, it tells you that it's working uh, well. Another advantage of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, of this new shaft, hollow shaft, is that uh, the irrigation system is very efficient and you can just uh, use your shaft in any position, uh, upwards, downwards, or laterally without any problem. Okay, so uh, there was a study uh, published in 2009 uh, with uh, 21 patients uh, operated of nasal polyps with coblation versus 16 with microdebrider. And there was less estimated blood loss with coblation and a similar procedure durations. Uh, 
um, there was also a, a, an animal study of coblation uh, uh, in the sinusal mucosa in sheep in sheeps and rabbits. And uh, uh, the authors found that there was an initial loss of epithelium and uh, of the endoline serum mucinous glands uh, using this coblation. So the epithelium recovered with squamous uh, metaplasia and the glands were replaced by fibrous tissue. So uh, the authors suggested that it might be important even when uses the coblation to try to spare the mucosa as much as possible in order to maintain an efficient mucociliary uh, ciliary clearance. So you have to have the same uh, to, to be uh, as cautious as uh, using any other instruments to try to spare the mucosa when you do this surgery. Now, uh, the example of uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal uh, angiofibroma. It is, uh, in my experience, I use it now all the times. It is critical to have a very good pre-op embolization to use a coblation because of course, otherwise you will be very bothered by, by the bleeding. But in the parts of the uh, angiofibroma, which, are, which is obviously well embolized, it is really uh, very uh, useful to uh, empty uh, the, in the internal parts of the, of the fibroma. Uh, and then uh, once you have done this, well, you can turn around the envelope of the angiofibroma and it's much easier to turn around the lesion when you have, once you have emptied the center of the lesions with, with the coblation. And I, I really think it's very useful. Um, so uh, regarding coblation and skull-based surgery, uh, there was a publication uh, in 2010 uh, encompassing uh, 23 procedures. Uh, there were six esthesioneuroblastoma, uh, three melanoma, three squamous cell carcinoma, three inverted papillomas, and two adenocarcinomas. And it was compared with uh, other kind of uh, techniques. And there was also less estimated blood loss and uh, better surgical field visualization with coblation. But of course, it was a small series and it has to be confirmed by uh, additional studies. Uh, there were there are also an, um, uh, a few studies uh, focusing on uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas. Uh, most of them are small case series. The largest series which was published regarding this uh, specific topic was published by Yi in uh, 2011. Uh, there were uh, 23 uh, uh, cases of GNA uh, of uh, rather small ones. And uh, 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 this, uh, this study found uh, uh, a reduced blood loss and a better visualization uh, using coblation. Another interesting study uh, published in the laryngoscope in 2010 uh, regards uh, nasal encephalocell. Uh, the authors used coblations in 22 patients to remove nasal encephalocell, and in, uh, they compared with a series of six uh, uh, patients uh, operated on with bipolar electrocautery. Uh, the sizes of the encephalocells were comparable in both groups. And uh, the authors found a reduced time, uh, a reduced operative time using uh, the coblation as compared to uh, bipolar electrocautery. There was no difference uh, in the incidence of bleeding events. And you can see here uh, the, the encephalocell progressively removed using uh, the coblation. Regarding uh, 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 HHT and coblation, it's also a very, uh, interesting uh, uh, indication. Uh, on this uh, slide, which was uh, uh, sent to me by uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey Terrell from University of Michigan, you can see uh, the, vari the various uh, HHT lesions that you can encounter. And uh, 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 Professor Terrell thinks that uh, the, the, the appropriate lesions uh, uh, for coblations are the moderate size arteriovenous malformations, uh, like uh, on these uh, pictures on the lo lower uh, left part of the slide. Um, uh, and uh, so this corresponds to, to uh, 
lesions uh, that uh, uh, are responsible for tablespoons, frequent, easily bleeds, anemia, and so on. So uh, uh, these are good indications. And also very large bulging uh, AVNs, which are pulsatile, uh, uh, can be uh, also good indications for, of coblations. And according to him, very small telangiectasias uh, telangiectasias can be treated uh, with other tools. Um, uh, so um, he settles uh, the ablate uh, uh, intensity at six or seven and the coagulation level at three. Uh, so he also use, uh, uses uh, the pro-size uh, pro uh, easy view, or you can use also the HALO uh, system uh, with a werewolf uh, controller. And the coagulation is at level three. Uh, uh, some tips, you, you first have to treat the largest lesions um, lesions are often larger in the submuckle space that, uh, than uh, their visible surface. So um, you have to, to go on coblating the lesion until it completely stops bleeding. And sometimes you can poke the edges of the surface you have ablated to see if there are no residual, if there, to, to be sure there is no residual uh, vessel uh, and lesion around the, the already ablated uh, surface. The, uh, you have to leave uh, uh, the small lesions if they overlap in the septal region in order to lower the risk of septal perforation. Uh, however, sometimes septal perforations are inevitable for large lesions extending through the septum, so, through the septum sorry. And uh, 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 final information is that anterior lesions are usually the ones uh, which bleed. So you, you usually focus on these anterior lesions first. So this is uh, a movie uh, that uh, I borrowed to uh, Professor Tero. You can see uh, using the, the precise easy view, uh, small telangiectasia, which are treated uh, with the coblation. Uh, you see that this patient already has a septal perforations due to previous treatments. And uh, there you see uh, the treatment of a larger uh, arterial venous mal malformation. And you can see how efficient the coblation can be in, for these lesions. Here another lesion at the level of the septum. And you can see that uh, there is still some uh, residual lesion uh, uh, under the mucosa. So you might think that you have treated the, the whole surface initially because uh, of the uh, appearance of the lesion at the level of the mucosa, but then you have to go on around uh, as long as it bleeds to be uh, sure that you completely treated the lesions uh, at the submucosal level. Okay. Uh, so the last point uh, uh, is uh, about adenoidectomy. Uh, I would like to talk about it because I, I'm a pediatric ENT, so I use it very often. Just to tell you that there was a publication in 2019, it was a meta-analysis on the 16 studies and 95 thousand seven hundred and twenty five uh, twenty seven sorry children and the rate of revision adenoidectomy using coblation was uh, one one point nine percent uh, in this uh, last uh, study sorry uh, and there was no correlation with the surgical tool that was used cur uh, cur curatage suction cautery micro debridement and coblation so coblation is as efficient as any other tool and here you can see uh, for instance, in a 4.5 year uh, old children, child, sorry, uh, the coblation of uh, uh, some uh, uh, adenoids, uh, I use, uh, uh, of course, an endoscopic control. And uh, you, it's very easy to gently remove um, the adenoids. And I'm satisfied uh, uh, when I can clearly see uh, uh, the nasal septum going through the mouth with a 70 degree angled endoscope. As you can see here on this image, 
you can see the, na the nasal septum, the posterior part of the nasal septum clearly visible at the end of the procedure. So it's, it's very nice because it's a, you have no uh, thermal uh, lesion. It's very smooth and very efficient. And again, you must, of course, take care uh, to avoid obstructing your shaft if you want it to be efficient. So uh, again, uh, regarding adenoidectomy with coblation, there was a prospective multicenter trial uh, published in 2015, and the coblation assisted adenoidectomy resulted in shorter operative time and reduced uh, uh, blood loss when compared with microdebrider assisted adenoidectomy. Um, and in another uh, uh, publication of 2015, there, was, there were uh, 1,280 cases of adenotonsillectomy with a significant reduced operating time with the monopolar cautery group, uh, but no difference in bleeding rates, whatever uh, the technique that was used. So in conclusion, uh, coblation is a very useful tool in the treatment of many nasal and sinus pathologies. Its main advantages are its precision, the absence of thermal lesions, the shaft malleability and the integrated ablation and coagulation modes. Thank you very much. So um, I don't know if we uh, should answer some question. I don't think that there is a, uh, there are additional questions. So maybe some things, uh, since you also talk about uh, HHT, maybe you can do your, your presentation now, now. Okay. So I'm just going to try and regain control, which I have now. So thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I'm just going to spend uh, the next few minutes just sharing what I've done uh, um, with uh, my HHT patients. We're just waiting for the slides to transition. There we go. Thank you. So I came across um, using coblation in my HHT patients uh, probably by accident uh, about three years ago. And it was partly because it was simple, simpler to set it up. And we, all, we almost always have coblation in, in our rhinology day case uh, theatre, uh, rather than having to bring in um, uh, the laser and set it up. And certainly it was very familiar with our, our theatre staff, uh, and it was almost an easy transition because we didn't have to bring in new equipment and, pay, and our, our staff were familiar with setting up coblation. It just kind of enhanced um, theatre flow. Um, it's certainly not a novel technique, and, and, and these are some of the papers that, that even Prof had alluded to. This was uh, the first study uh, by a group in America looking at two cohorts, one with the KTP uh, uh, and the other with the coblation. Um, and essentially, uh, what they concluded uh, was that both, both are, are just as, as, as effective in reducing the severity and frequency um, of epistaxis. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, there have been uh, two further papers, essentially how I do it papers, uh, where the senior authors have shared um, their little technical tips. Uh, and, and, and that's certainly one of the, uh, the videos that Prof uh, may have uh, shared earlier as well. Um, certainly for me, um, uh, preoperatively, um, I try not to pack the nose uh, 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 at all, uh, and this is very, very different to other rhinological patients who come in for their, their procedures. And the rationale really is that I don't want to traumatize the mucosa whatsoever. And if any packing or, or, or nasal cavity preparation is required, I do it intraoperatively via an endoscope. Um, uh, certainly limiting your suction and so you do not want to, to be introducing unnecessarily a phrase of sucker into the nasal cavity because as you're aware um, the suction tips can be quite sharp they can traumatize the mucosa that also means uh, reducing the amount of irrigation so some of us may use 
uh, an endoscope cleaning system and certainly reducing that irrigation so that you're not filling the nasal cavity with so much saline that you're then having to introduce a suction catheter into the nasal cavity uh, and, and certainly uh, preventing trauma with, with, with the endoscope and instruments that you introduce in, into the nasal cavity. And initially, I was actually lubricating the sites of my endoscope and other instruments uh, with a bit of, of KY jelly just to kind of reduce the amount of mucosal trauma. Uh, I, I've certainly not, not done that more recently uh, but that's certainly something that other people have, have done. Uh, my preferred instrument now for my HHT patient is the ProSize Easy One. I leave it on default settings. Um, and the only slight variation to, to um, how other people have done it uh, is that I, don't, I try not to have the tip of the, um, the wand in contact with mucosa, so I kind of hover it over the telangiectasia, uh, and I almost always start anteriorly as, and, and then working uh, posteriorly because um, I don't want the, um, to, to tackle the large telangiectasia more posteriorly, but then traumatizing the anterior part of the nasal cavity uh, beforehand. And certainly if, if one cannot get control uh, of, of that kind of constant ooze, uh, then certainly it's much easier to pack the nose anteriorly rather than have to pack the entire nasal cavity. So it was certainly things that I learned uh, to kind of manage over the last two to three years uh, of, of using the coblator. Um, so this is a video, you can see the telangiectasia there. Um, and I'll show you, the first part of the video shows you what happens when the tip of the coblator is in direct contact with the mucosa. Uh, sometimes you get sticking, uh, and obviously when you when you when you when you lift the, the, the wand off, you get a bit of bleeding, as you have seen on the screen there. Um, but otherwise, I, I tend to use the coagulation pedal rather than the ablate. Uh, and again, it's 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 hovering and ensure that you have sufficient amounts of saline. Uh, and, and, and the saline is important, obviously, to, to create that plasma feel, but also prevent that kind of sticking of the tip of your instrument onto mucosa. Um, and you can see how, how the, uh, the mucosa, um, there you go, uh, gets kind of slightly um, uh, ablated there, or coagulated there, rather. Um, and that's all I do, really. Uh, and then once I've tackled the, the, the telangiectasia anteriorly, then I work my way more and more posteriorly. Uh, but with all these, these telangiectasia, there has to be a point when we stop. You can't chase every single telangiectasia within the nasal cavity. Um, so certainly I, 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 I repeat what Prof had said earlier, you, you try and tackle the largest ones, the most visible ones, um, um, and, and then you, you, you coagulate them. So thank you, any questions? Yes, I think there is one question. Um, uh, so uh, uh, one question was uh, uh, about the, the safety of uh, uh, coblation wand on the nasal mucosa for HA. Uh, is it unsafe to use coblation wand uh, on the nasal mucosa for HHT as it might cause metaplasia to surface epithelium? I think if that was true, then certainly whatever other technologies that we would use, whether it's laser or bipolar, would, 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 would bear the same argument. Um, I, I slightly disagree with that because the thermal energy that goes through the wand and onto the mucosa is significantly less than, say, laser or bipolar. If you remember the first um, presentation, whether it's ablate or coagulate, the temperature never exceeds 90 degrees Celsius. Um, so I think there is there is very very uh, there is certain limitation of the the thermal spread and thermal damage and I think overall uh, I I don't think that then uh, results in significant metaplasia of the mucosa. Yes, absolutely. Indeed, this is certainly the most delicate uh, instrument that you can find on the market regarding this, this specific point. That's clear. 
And also the reinforcement of this, if we had that, and if that was true, we would have a number of metaplastic noses starting from pediatric age up to, you know, uh, uh, long in, in adulthood. We treat lots of epistaxis. I have, because we, when you do pediatric ENT, you have the wand in your hands, you take tonsils, adenoids, the mother uh, 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 on the entry to tear just says, by, by the way, doctor, can you check the nose? Because he keeps bleeding from you know, the right nostril, the left nostril. So um, although I don't have a large series of HST, I have treated some, uh, but uh, I treat routinely um, the epistaxis. And my trick on, on to, uh, or avoiding sticking is to fill the nostril with your saline. So you, you just uh, press the pedal, fill the nostril with saline, you have your medium and just touch gently or hover, as you said, hover above, don't make uh, absolute contact and and it glides uh, it works very well okay um do you use coffee coffee in cane spray i don't know what it is so ah that must be a delegate from the uk um certainly with the hht patients um uh I, I would consider doing using that intraoperatively so that uh, it decongests the nose. It allows passage of the endoscope and instruments, but certainly not preoperatively. Uh, and that, that was just learning from my mistakes when I first started treating HHT patients where um, uh, preoperative uh, packing of the nasal cavity with a decongestant led to quite significant epistaxis and resulting in the entire procedure being abandoned because we just couldn't stop the bleeding uh, with bipolar or whatever it was at the, uh, on the day. Um, so certainly preoperatively for my HHT patient, the, the deviation from my standard practice is not preparing the nasal cavity and doing that uh, intraoperatively. So whether it's adrenaline or cofinalcaine, um, it, it's just whatever that, that, that um, the scrub staff would provide on the day. Okay, great. Okay, I think we have all now to give the floor to uh, Dr. Marie Lundberg from Helsinki University Central Hospital, uh, which will now uh, talk about the ENT Act Stapler. Marie? Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me and see me because I lost, uh, lost you on the videos, but I hope you can see me. Yes, we can see you. Anyway, very good. Um, Okay, thank you so much for, for inviting me to talk about the um, intact stapler for closing uh, septal flap, flaps after septoplasty. Um, now I went, okay, here is the first slide. Uh, I forgot my disclosures, it's this, this one, and then I've done uh, Ranetti studies with um, uh, Cordate uh, Medical Company. Um, for those who uh, don't know the intact stapler, it's a um, device that contains eight staplers made of uh, PLGA, which is the same as Vicryl, that is there bioresorbable. Um, and the device is introduced into the nostrils on both sides of the cartilage after septoplasty. And then the mucosa is stapled to the cartilage. Um, the staples are three millimeters high and uh, 0 0.5 millimeters uh, in diameter. So quite small. Now, so why do we then uh, want to close the mucosal space, the dead space between the mucosa and the cartilage? It's to prevent um, complications mostly. Uh, the cartilage doesn't have any, any um, uh, blood vessels in it, so so it gets all the oxygen and things it needs from the mucosa. And then if you have a dead space, it, you can also um, have a hematoma there or then an abscess. So we would like to close it very well after the operation. This is a large uh, study from Poland, uh, looking at uh, complications after septoplasty, and uh, the most common ones were bleeding or hematoma in 2.6%, and then infection or prolonged he healing abscess in 2%. And then we had septal per perforations, which is also something you have to think about when you decide what you're gonna close your septoplasty with. Um, so the methods you the, have to choose between 
are splints, usually made of silicone, uh, sutures, then uh, different kinds of tamponades, and then the stapler. And um, what you have to think about is uh, beyond the complications, uh, the risk of bleeding, um, uh, does the patient have any, any anticoagulatives on? How much, what is your operative technique? Did you do with the swinging door or did you take the, the um, cartilage out? How much stability do you need? Then of course the comfort and the pain of the patient um, after the septoplasty. Then breathing, for example, in sleep apnea patients, uh, breathing is uh, really um, important or for everybody bleeding, uh, breathing is important, but, but for, for them, the, uh, the need of the CPAP. Uh, would be would need the CPAP very fast. Uh, then the possibility for a follow-up visit. I understand that in most European uh, cities, that it, it's always possible to have the follow-up visit. It's the same in Helsinki, with a, which is a large city. But we also have Lapland in this land um, up north, where you might have 400 kilometers to your closest hospital. So then, then the follow-up visit is not that easy to arrange. Then of course the availability, price, and time is money, especially in the OR. I looked up a little bit about the literatures, uh, literature on methods of closure. Um, the splints give a lot of support and they give a moist environment. They're easy, fast, and cheap. Some uh, studies say that they prevent adhesions, but others say that they create adhesions. Um, some say the patients have no pain. Some say that they have some pain. The tamponades are quite um, uh, discomfortable for the patient. They create pressure, which redu reduces the risk for bleeding, but it also um, can cause tissue damage. And there are reports of toxic shocks after tamponades. Um, they always have to be removed and um, there is usually bleeding upon removal. The patients might get a um, mouth, dry, dry mouth and in even respiratory distress with the tamponades. Sutures are quite coming cl quite close to the stapler. They give longer support. They are absorbable, cheap, and they very effectively uh, minimize the dead space and allow for normal breathing. But the Application of sutures is very slow. Um, and some reports say that it, they cause foreign body reactions and a lot of inflammations and even perforations, especially if you sew them too tight. Then there is risk for tissue damage. Then we come to the stapler. Uh, I go through um, the studies that are published on, on staplers. The first one came in what, 2010, I think. Um, 25 patients prospective uh, multicenter study, which tried to determine uh, the functional performance and the safety. And they found a 100% complete co-optation of the uh, flaps in one week, no post-operative hematomas. 21% of the patients had mild inflammations uh, around the staples, but nothing worse than that. And the application took less than 60 seconds. So they concluded it's safe, efficient, and effective. Then the next one was a single surgeon um, study. Random, the patients were randomized in three groups, stapler, sutures, and or removable packs that were uh, taken out after two days, 60 patients, and a three-week follow-up. And they looked at complications, comfort, and performance. They saw no complications at all, um, which is quite good for 60 patients, I would say, when you look at the normal percentages of complications. Um, there was a lot of discomfort in the packing group, but the sutures and staplers were equal. Patients were quite, quite comfortable. Um, the results at three weeks were also equal in all three groups, the no score, the acoustic rhinometry, and the quality of life score. So they concluded that the stapler was equally good as sutures, uh, and this, but the surgical time was optimized. The next one um, is quite uh, similar to the, to the last one, 16 patients, three-week follow-up, randomized into suture or stapler. 
Um, they save six minutes uh, per patient in the safer group. Uh, the no score was um, improved in both groups and they found no statistical difference in complications. One adhesion in the suture group and one perforation in the stapler group. Then we come to our study. Um, just a few words about how we do surgery here in Helsinki. Helsinki University Hospital is, I think, the biggest ENT hospital in Europe. We are uh, 60, about 60 ENT doctors, um, a population around here about one and a half million people and we get 18,000 new ENT referrals every year. So we have a broad material coming here. We do about 300 septoplasties every year. The mean age of the patients is about 40 years, and that's quite normal. Uh, we do 68% in local anesthesia. Some of them get some sedation, but um, only 32% we do in GA. Um, and local anesthesia means cocaine um, and lidocaine, adrenaline. Um, most of them are also day surgery. Only those who um, have, for example, sleep apnea or heart problems or so stay the night. Um, we give them one dose of antibiotics 30 to 60 minutes before surgery. And we have shown that this is as effective as giving one week of um, post-operative antibiotics. This is actually, um, the article is submitted, so you can find it yet. But, um, but um, this is also going according to the WHO recommendations. So uh, this is how we do it. And closure is done with, it depends on the doctor. We, are, we, we decide ourselves, but 26% uh, are closed with staplers. 57% with silicone splints, which, which is probably the traditional one. And some get tamponades. Very few get only tamponades, I would say. Um, it's mostly combined with, with splints or sometimes with the stapler. Afterwards, they spray with salt water directly after, and this goes for, for all the closure methods um, and uh, painkillers, of course. Uh, if they are, have tamponades, it's, they are uh, taken away the next day. Uh, patients usually do it themselves at home. Um, um, silicone splints are removed after a week. And with the stapler, it depends on the surgeon. But um, nowadays, we don't really have any, we don't take them up for follow-up at all, the staplers, if, um, if not, uh, if there is no... Um, problem during surgery or then if the surgeon wants to see the patient him or herself just for for the learning sake of learning but me i have done quite a few of these i don't usually take the staples for follow-up they are allowed to call me if they have any problems um, and they do so um, yeah then to our uh, study with 457 septoplasties performed from 2015, and this was the year when we uh, took the safer in use here in Helsinki. Uh, 100, 101 patients uh, uh, had, were stapled, and the other ones, all of the other ones, independent on, on what method was used, were the control group. And we looked at the complication rate, the surgical time in real life, and uh, follow-up visits, and then the costs. Uh, this was... Um, we wanted to see if uh, we can um, continue using the stapler or, or if we would, on a longer, on a longer uh, follow-up period, find, uh, for example, perforations or so. Now, the problem is that this was retrospective, of course, so, so there might be per perforations that we don't know about. But since we are about the only hospital uh, ENT hospital, we think that all, and we are the only place who who um, repairs perforations in southern Finland. We think that all of them would have sooner or later come to us. Uh, age changes, smoking, um, ASA classification, septoplasty didn't affect complication rate, 
And the mean length of surgery was about the same in the staple group and the control group in this real life study. Um, I would say that nowadays the stapler group would probably be a little bit um, faster. In the beginning, there was a lot of fuss about finding the staplers and knowing how to use them and so on. Um, but the silicon splints, uh, which are very much in use, are also quite fast. Um, complications. Uh, there was no difference in, in the rate of complications between the stapler group and the control group. We found one hematoma and one perforation in the stapler group. I think it was the same patient. If I No, it wasn't actually, sorry. Um, but uh, otherwise, and the infection rates that say 5.9 and 5.1, that's actually inflammation rate. They were not all infections. The infection rate is about 3%. Um, then we looked at the planned follow-up visits. Um, the stapler patients had less planned follow-up visits, and nowadays they don't have follow-up visits at all, usually. But, of course, they then, again, had more unplanned follow-up visits, calling us and saying that the, it's painful or it's um, inflamed or, or I would like to ask this and this. Um, so that rate was higher, but when we ca calculated everything together, um, the stapler patient had much less uh, follow-up visits here. And why we wanted to, do, to see this is because we are a state hospital. We, we need to, to um, uh, tell our bosses why we are using this device that is much more expensive um, than the silicon splints and how we can save this money. And by if we don't take um, a patient for a follow-up control, the silicon splints always have to be removed. So you always have to have them at least once. Here, um, the follow-up visit is, is more um, expensive than the stapler. So, so then we can make up for, for this use of the stapler. We couldn't make up for the price with the shorter operation time. Uh, it was uh, so, so little shorter. Uh, but we think that the stapler is safe and that we could continue using it uh, also in the future. Then a few words about how I use it in my hands. This is completely unscientific. Um, I usually suture the caudal incision first with, um, with uh, something bioresorbable. And then after that, I fix the cartilage in the middle, I fix the mucosa to the cartilage. Sometimes if I have taken out a big piece of cartilage, I might staple it first and then check that it's in the right position. And then after that suture. Um, with the old stapler, you had to introduce uh, the stapler with, um, with a speculum or, or just uh, with a septum elevator, uh, just widening in the ailers. But with the new one, you might just put it in the nose. And then you staple over maximum a large area. Uh, with the staple, you can also fix mucosal tears. Um, if, it, if, if the mucosa has, has teared a lot, then, then you can try to patch it with it. And um, then I um, turn the staple around. So I staple first from one side, four of them, and then from the other side, four. Usually not all of them fix to the mucosa and the cartilage. Some of them drop off. So I would say from eight, eight of them, six or seven will, will, will fix. But I had thought that since it's asymmetrical, the staple, then it's good to fix it from both sides. I don't know if this is, is, um, makes any sense, but this is how I do it. I asked my colleagues when they use the stapler and when they do not. And um, one thing that they said in children and small noses, they didn't use it. But now actually the new intact is much smaller. And now I, I've used it in pediatric patients also. Um, the old one was so big that you couldn't really introduce it into very small noses. And now patching tear mucosa is also easier. Some said that they always use splints if the uh, if the mucosa is very damaged just to create a moisture uh, moist environment 
uh, very few use it, or nobody uses it in rhinoplasties, uh, very few in septicolumelloplasties, thinking that the that you shouldn't move the, the columella and it needs a little bit more uh, stabilizing. Actually, I've now used it in a few um, septicolumelloplasties. If the columella is very well fixed, I don't see why I couldn't staple um, behind the columella. Um, and they've become very good, so so I think it works. Um, mm, yeah, with a new one, you get a better visibility. You can um, you can target the staples a little bit better, and um, and uh, you can use it in small noses. And here's a video. It's not it's not the best one. This is my colleague who 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 puts it in. You saw that she put in the staples just without any any um, speculum or anything. It just went in the nose and then she staples. She doesn't turn it around. She staples first the, the frontal part. I don't think it matters what part you start with. It's just maybe easier to, to fix the flaps in the uh, anterior parts first so that you see the posterior parts better. And you will see the, the staples in a few seconds. There you can see one. And you can see that it's fixed on the mucosa and then it will absorb. I think the official um, statement is in one to six months, but I would say when I've seen them after two weeks, they are already falling off. Um, now we go in to the nose and just check them. There you can see when they they are shining and on the mucosa. And then the, the other side, they are not very well, well visible on the other side. There you can see the small ones, but that's because they are asymmetrical. And that was all for my part. Thank you so much. Thank Were there any questions? Well, I think it's uh, unfortunately time to uh, finish this uh, this webinar because it's uh, it's eight, it's seven p.m. Um, somebody asked if we have to remove the suture. However, uh, no, you don't have to. The say you don't have to remove the staples. They are bioresorbable, so they they like vicryl, so they disappear. Okay, great. So I think this is all. Um, I thank all the speakers for their uh, outstanding uh, communications. And, uh, uh, and uh, then uh, uh, I think that you have, up, yeah. you have many different indications and uh, uh, also uh, uh, saying goodbye to people. Increasing, increasing uh, indications for nasal uh, surgery of the. Uh, this uh, wonderful uh, coblation tool, and I hope you will be con you have been convinced by this presentation. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, is there any other comment by all the speakers? Or thank you everybody for your attention and some good luck with catching your train. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our session for today. We've had some great interaction and good questions. Thank you to our great faculty for their time and coming to speak to everyone today. Your knowledge and expertise is hugely appreciated, so thank you. If you want to learn more about any of the topics covered in these sessions, then please check out our Education Unlimited website. You will have access to all our medical education content, including webinars, surgical technique videos, and clinical evidence. If you have qualified to receive an attendance certificate and CPD points, you will receive